Hi everyone, welcome to our presentation on how convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, can be used to help classify cassava leaf diseases. Before we get into the technical aspects of this project, we'd like to briefly introduce you to our team. Hi everyone, my name is Griffin McCauley and I'm currently a junior concentrating in applied mathematics and economics here at Brown University. In addition to this, I'm also a runner and compete for Brown's varsity cross country and track and field teams. Hey again, my name is Ethan, and I'm a junior at Brown concentrating in applied math. In my free time, I enjoy analyzing and discussing sports statistics with my friends. <laughs> Wonderful. Now that introductions are out of the way, we would love to set the stage for this project and explain the background and motivation for it. This project was inspired by a recent Kaggle competition where contestants were tasked with using novel deep learning techniques to help farmers in Africa diagnose and classify what disease their crops were afflicted with. This is such an important mission, since cassava plants are the second largest producer of carbohydrates on the continent, and although over 80% of small household farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa grow this root, few have the ability to detect and mitigate the devastating effects of disease outbreaks with which they are regularly plagued. At present, in order to assess whether one's plants are stricken with disease, farmers must work with local government officials to deploy agricultural experts to inspect the plants in person. Unfortunately, this process is extremely labor-intensive, slow, and inefficient, which puts farmers at greater risk for losing larger portions of their harvest if they are indeed dealing with an outbreak amongst their plants. In order to help speed up this process and provide farmers with the best opportunity to save their crops, it is our goal to help develop a convolutional neural network which will be able to quickly and accurately classify whether a given plant is suffering from a disease or not by simply providing the model with an image of that plant's leaves. Contestants are given about 20,000 images of cassava plants and their corresponding labels to train their model on, and are judged based on the accuracy of their model on a separate set of testing data. While the competition took place last month in February, Students in Brown University's Data Science Initiative were challenged to make the best model possible using concepts from class and compare their results with the competition's leaders. To document our steps, Ethan and I wrote a series of three blog posts published on Medium. Instead of switching back and forth between the slides and other resources, we have included the most pertinent aspects of our blogs and code in the following presentation slides. A link to all three blog posts, the slides that are currently being displayed, and all relevant code is included on the title page, as well as in the description below. In the initial blog, we conducted some exploratory data analysis and came up with a baseline model that we used to compare our future model's scores to. As you can see in the following graphic, each plant can be classified into five categories, healthy or one of four possible diseases. Even though each of the five classes have certain unique characteristics, this table of 15 images reveals how difficult it is for the human eye to distinguish between the four different types of diseased leaves, and between healthy and diseased leaves in general. Looking through the training data we had access to, we found that cassava mosaic disease, or CMD, was by far the most common of the five classes, so we used a majority classifier that simply declared every image it saw as having CMD. This produced a tech test accuracy of roughly 61.3%, which doesn't sound terrible, but the assignment process was completely agnostic to the image it was being provided. In order for our model to provide any meaningful prediction of a, the class of a given plant image, it has to do significantly better than this threshold. From the get-go, we knew that transfer learning would play an integral role in our model, and in order to effectively implement the right base model, we decided to try experimenting with five of the most popular ones, VGG16, DenseNet, Inception V3, Exception, and ResNet. Using each of these bases and just a couple fully connected layers on top prior to the output layer containing the five classes, we found that both ResNet50 and DenseNet169 produced the best results and were quite comparable to each other. But, since ResNet50 was able to be trained at a faster speed and had the more straightforward architecture, we decided to use this as our base model. From here we began thinking more critically about the features of the dense layers we would be attaching to the base model. We decided that we wanted to transition from convolutional base layers to the fully connected layers of the head model as quickly as possible, 
and that we wanted the number of nodes in the preceding layers to decrease by a factor of 4 at each sequential layer until the final output nodes. With the layers formed, we now applied ReLU activations between them to add the nonlinearity we needed for the multilayer perceptron portion of the model to be successful. We also used HE normal kernel initializers, since these are ideally configured to work with ReLU activations. Finally, we implemented batch normalization prior to each layer in order to help mitigate overfitting and to re-standardize the post-activation values about the mean of the mini-batch. Although some articles say that it is better to put batch normalization before activations, in most empirical studies, it has been demonstrated that using batch normalization after nonlinearity has been introduced is actually superior, so that is what we did here. With our architecture established, it was now time to find the best hyperparameters to cause our model to train optimally. Since we had settled on the architecture fairly early on, we decided to focus our attention and time on the hyperparameters that govern the training process rather than the complexity of the model itself. Many resources we came across really emphasized that the learning rate is the most important hyperparameter of any model, so this is the one we honed in on first. We trained our model using a range of learning rates in order to establish an upper bound above which the training process would diverge from any sort of ideal behavior, and a lower bound below which the training process was essentially stagnant unless given exorbitant amounts of time. We eventually narrowed it down and discovered that a learning rate of 0.0001 was optimal. Having established this, we then proceeded to seek the ideal batch size testing sizes of 16, 32, 48, 64, and 128, we found that the validation loss values were significantly lower for smaller batch sizes and that the training time was only marginally longer. According to literature, any batch size lower than 16 would yield suboptimal results due to the high variance between batches, so we decided to go with a final batch size of 16. Lastly, when developing our architecture, we found that freezing the base layers was having severely negative impacts on our model performance, and this led us to leave them completely unfrozen. Unfortunately, this also left us vulnerable to overfitting concerns, so we knew we needed to include some regularization in order to help mitigate this concern. Since we wanted to restrict the magnitudes of the model's weight parameters without actually forcing them to zero and potentially creating dead nodes, we opted to use L2 regularization as opposed to L1 regularization. With a penalty value of just 0 .001 on each dense layers as parameters, we observed much better training behavior and were satisfied with the inductive biases results. One final point to note here is that we used the Atom optimizer throughout, since we felt as though it was one of the most robust optimizers at our disposal and had outperformed a few others such as RMS prop during some of our experimental training runs. Just having gone through the hyperparameter tuning and architectural design processes described previously, we were able to get our model's test accuracy score up to 81%, but we knew that there was still room for improvement. In order to boost our performance metrics even further, we added data augmentation to the pre-processing steps and tried to determine which alterations would allow our training data to be the most diverse while still maintaining the basic characteristics of cassava leaves. Through our experimentation, it became readily apparent that color and pigmentation were playing a major role in how the model was able to differentiate between the different conditions, so altering features such as brightness, hue, saturation, and contrast caused our performance to increase appreciably and also helped reduce overfitting. The color changes were implemented using the TensorFlow image class but in order to add some other augmentations such as flipping and rotation, characteristics that should not inherently change a condition's visual appearance, we needed to use Keras's pre-processing class. These layers were added into our model as a compact submodel using the sequential wrapper. Having successfully added all of these augmentation components on the data side of our model, we are now seeing test accuracy scores all the way in the mid to upper 80s. These improved results demonstrated the great value data augmentation provides to the training process and gave our model the boost it needed to be right up there with the top finishers of the Kaggle competition. One thing we started to notice was that training our model for longer durations caused the final parameters of the model to 
to be inferior to the parameters that corresponded to the best validation metrics. This prompted us to implement an early stopping callback that would monitor the validation loss with the patients of 10 epics and restore the best weights that had been found during the course of training. To ensure that the model was able to learn everything it could from the training data that generalized to the overall data population, we trained the model for a large number of epics to guarantee that the early stopping condition would be triggered at some point. Otherwise, the model may have been able to learn more from the training data since the validation losses must have been decreasing. With all of these previous techniques in place, we moved to explore one final topic, ensembling. Ensembling serves to reduce the variance of a given model's predictions and often leads to accuracy improvements if each model is good at analyzing different features. We decided to simply ensemble our two best models by averaging their predictions. This ensembling method is called soft voting, whereas hard voting simply uses the most confident models as prediction. Ensembling allowed our model to achieve a record high test accuracy of 88.1%. And although this, was, although this was just a modest improvement from our individual best model, using two models allows our results to be less susceptible to the variability that is inherent to any specific model. Because of that, ensembling is almost always worth the effort if, it, if the combined product can yield any improvement in accuracy. With our models complete, we can now visualize the training process for one of the best models included in our final ensemble. As you can see from the plot, the validation metrics adhere beautifully to the training ones, and we have managed to prevent any discerning overfitting. Generally, we found the losses to level off around 0.5 and the accuracy scores to get into the upper 80s, but we were never able to crack the 89% barrier to compete with the front runners of the competition in which the leader's model had an accuracy of 91.3%. From reading other contestants' notebooks, it seems clear that ensembling a large number of models together was the key to success. So it would be interesting to see what sort of performance we could have achieved with a larger ensemble. At the end of the day, however, these were the final results we were able to produce with our best single model and the ensemble of our two best models. We believe that achieving a score of roughly 88% puts our model in a position where it truly could have positive impacts on the lives of those who may use it, and that we have accomplished a lot towards achieving our goal of using novel deep learning techniques to help solve a real-world problem that has gone unintended for too long. We look forward to continuing our pursuit of applying these technologies in meaningful and impactful ways and are excited for what the data-driven future holds. Thank you so much for your time and attention and we hope you enjoyed our presentation.